Well, thank you all for coming. I'll start right away because uh, I want to leave uh, as much time for conversation. This is a, a philosophy uh, presentation and uh, one of the really wonderful things about philosophy is that there are so many ideas and so many angles and, and so much um, critical thinking and analysis. It makes us feel quite human. It's one of the one of the quintessential humanistic disciplines. So I'm going to introduce, introduce um, uh, Leila Sachi, who is a philosopher and instructor in the Irvin D. Reed Honors College here at Wayne. Her research interests are motivated by her masters in Near East languages and philosophical problems that arrive from religious exclusivism. Um, she's a specialist in both current and modern Islamic jurisprudence, as well as epistemology. Um, her work resides at the intersection of epistemology and, uh, and Islamic studies with healthy doses of, of uh, social epistemology and religious epistemology. Uh, she's a recipient of several academic awards, including the King Chavez Park's Future Faculty Fellowship and several graduate professional scholarships. She's, she's authored an article entitled Law, Women's Legal Thoughts and Jurisprudence, which was published in the Oxford Encyclopedia of Islam and, and Women. And she was a co-author on a chapter entitled Ali and Nino Identities and Information Literacy uh, in an edited volume entitled uh, Approaches to Kurban, Saeed's Ali and, and Nino Love Identity and Transcultural Conflict. At present, she is focused on epistemic uh, questions pertaining to disagreement and she's interested in exploring the implications of epistemology of uh, the epistemology of disagreement on interreligious exclusivism and uh, group identity. Today, her talk is going to be on intra-religious reasonable pair disagreement, debunking uh, the true Islam. And I want to welcome her to the podium and thank her for her friendship to the Humanities Center over the years. She and I go back many, many years. She worked, once worked with me in the Humanities Center and, and in various other capacities. She's always been a friend of the center. So thank you, Leila, and um, off you go. And uh, I wish you well in your talk. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. Um, before I get started, I just want to mention something, and I hope I don't put the person on the spot, but I feel in a way that I've come full circle because I see Dr. Catherine Kim in the audience. And I just wanted to acknowledge her because it was really her talk at the Humanities Center that put me on this path. And um, I really appreciate her being here. And it really is just, I don't know, what's the term, serendipitous or, but so thank you. Thank you everybody for, for coming and for taking an interest in my work. Um, the talk I'm gonna give today is uh, based on the last chapter of my dissertation that I defended um, last semester. I didn't, um, get a chance to really develop my thoughts in there um, because it, it was the last sort of applied chapter of my dissertation. But what I hope in this next sort of stage of my life and my research, I wanna take this further. Um, so I'm really interested in um, what the audience thinks about my formulation of reasonable disagreement, especially as it applies to uh, religious studies. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint. Well, I guess I should put it on the slideshow first. Okay, one second. Okay, so now I'll share my PowerPoint. Okay, so as the title of my talk uh, presents, I'm interested in how interreligious peer disagreement affects exclusive claims like that, which say that this is or 
this is not truly Islamic. Um, my more extended hope is that the, uh, the model that I present for reasonable disagreement in religious studies is, is also applicable beyond religious studies in, in other ideological circumstances. Um, so this is the framework or the roadmap for how I hope to proceed. So first I'll give a little explanation of why I think this subject is important. Um, then why I think that you should think <laughs> this subject is important. Um, then I'm going to give you a brief overview of the current received wisdom on the epistemology of disagreement. And then um, segue into my theory that mutual reasonable peer disagreement is possible. This is a controversial subject within epistemology at the moment. Um, not everyone agrees that mutual and sustained reasonable disagreement is possible between peers. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, and then I will apply that to a current uh, Islamic belief about women's head covering and argue that when there is um, sustained and mutual reasonable disagreement between peers with respect to women's head covering, then the truth of whether Islam requires women to cover their hair remains undefined. Okay, so let's proceed. So me, who am I? Many of you, if not all of you, know me um, quite well, but just as a brief, um, in 2003, as an undergrad, um, I started wearing the headscarf. And um, when I started to wear the headscarf, as you can imagine, I was met with a lot of various sort of views of like consternation, of disappointment, of encouragement. And um, it was really a little shocking to me how everybody had a say in something that seemed very personal to me. Um, but what stuck out the most and what planted the first seed for this project so many years ago was something that a, a, a mentor of mine said at that time. And they said, you know, in the Quran, it doesn't say explicitly that women should cover their hair. And I said, oh, yeah, I know, even though I didn't at the time. <laughs> and I, I realized now that she was actually referencing a certain line of reasoning, a certain argument with respect to whether women ought to or ought not to um, cover their hair. And that was that, you know, if it's not written in the Quran explicitly, then it's really up to the individual to reason to that conclusion for themselves. Um, so that sort of planted the first seed. Um, and then if you'll indulge one more short anecdote, um, I hope will elucidate the motivation, overall motivation for this project. Um, my daughter, uh, who recently turned 13, uh, decided to wear the headscarf when she was eight. And eight is early. <laughs> um, no, nobody, I, as far as I know, um, holds the view that women ought to wear their wear a headscarf as early as that. And I was sort of taken it back as well. And I said, you know, why you know, are you doing this? It wasn't my behest that she was doing. And she said, well, mama, you know, I want to get comfortable with it um, when I have to wear it. And I was both pleased because I was never good at planning and still am not. Um, but also, you know, I was like, no, oh, please, like just remain my little girl a little while longer. Okay, so to cut to the chase. So when she turned 13, I asked her again, as I normally do, like periodically, I said, you know, how are you doing? You know, how is wearing the headscarf? And, and she said, you know, she admitted, she said, you know, well, it's hard. Um, and, it, you know, I, I've thought about taking it off. And, and I said, okay, and so what do you think about that? And she said, well, honestly, it just feels good to do what's good. And I said, okay, well, that's a nice reason. Um, and I said, but do you think that it's bad not to do it? And she sort of gave me this confused look. And I said, um, of course, it's, you know, good to do what's good. Like if we can, you know, we, you know, ought to help people who are in need. 
But then, you know, you should wonder that whether it's bad not to help people in need when you can. And of course, you know, philosophers have all kinds of views about that. And I know there are many utilitarians probably in the crowd that are going, yes, it is bad not to help people when you can, right? Um, but in, in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, this subject, what I was basically asking her is, do you think Islam requires women to wear the headscarf? Um, and that's something that, you know, I have struggled with pretty much my whole life. And I think I've come to an understanding of where things lie with this. And I, and I wanna share that with you. So um, the ethic of modesty is central to Islam. There's no disagreement about that. This is a verse, uh, part of a verse uh, and uh, part of a chapter in the Quran you know, say to the believing men that they should lower their gaze and guard, guard their modesty. That's one verse. And then the following verse says, say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty. So there is this parallel. Um, but you'll notice I have a dot, dot, dot at the end. And that's because the verse goes on and is quite explicit about um, where and when women ought to observe their modesty. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So this is something that is not controversial in Islam. It is an ethic that is universal among Muslims. The question is, is women's head covering a necessary component of this ethic of modesty? Okay. Um, so the Mm, further motivation for this project has been instances or circumstances in which um, I've come across people who say, well, um, sure, it's up to the person to wear the headscarf or not, but they're really not res uh, representing Islam correctly if they don't, right? Um, so, it's like when we hear in the media or around us and people say, oh, well, you're free to have whatever opinion you want, but um, there's only one justified one. There's only one true one. Um, and it's that kind of rhetoric. It's that ki those kinds of claims that I'm targeting here. Um, so, you might wonder what uh, philosophy, let alone epistemology, has to do with religious belief and faith. Um, there are many people who would say, well, you know, religious belief and faith are based on um, a justification that is not, or a reasoning that is not properly philosophical or properly um, evidence-based or something like that. Um, and while that might be true, when people, when um, exclusivists in particular, religious exclusivists in particular, make claims um, like, you know, what is authentically Islamic practice or inauthentic, um, they are stumbling into philosophical and epistemic territory. Um, so because exclusivists about what or who is truly Islamic compels its adherents to identify what Islam truly requires, they often end up participating in a no true Scotsman fallacy. Um, so I will show in this talk that when a purportedly authentic Islamic practice, in this case, the subject of my talk is wearing the headscarf, is the subject of peer disagreement, then the truth of whether it is or is not authentic remains undefined. And people who participate in uh, identifying head covering as authentic are actually participating in a no true Scotsman fallacy. Okay. 
So let's start by understanding um, what the epistemology of disagreement is. Um, sometimes we understand reasonable disagreement as a kind of agreeing to disagree. Um, but I'm going to ask you to consider what that really amounts to. What does agreeing to disagree uh, really amount to? Um, one way of understanding agreeing to disagree is to say, well, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. You know, you hold your opinion, I'll hold mine, and we'll agree to disagree. Um, another way of thinking about it is to say, well, you know, we're disagreeing. Maybe there is just no satisfactory way to settle the disagreement. So based on the evidence we have, you know, um, we can, you know, you believe what you want to believe and I'll believe what I want to believe. Okay, so these are two ways. I'm not saying that these are the only ways to think about agreeing to disagree, um, but surely, you know, I think you, you would agree <laughs> that these are, are two possible ways. Okay, so let's take the first one. So you're entitled to your opinion. What does that mean? Well, on translation might be you're, you're wrong, um, but you have a right to your opinion, right? I think that that's, that's okay as a translation. Um, what is the epistemology of that amount to? Well, we're saying that the total evidence doesn't justify your view uh, or there is an error in your reasoning, one that you know I don't have and I'm okay, right? But still, you're entitled to your opinion. The problem of peer disagreement um, is that it can lead to dogmatism, right? It can lead to situations where I'm right, you're wrong, right? You're entitled to your opinion, but I'm right. And if you take that too far, you know, then we're traipsing into dogmatic territory. Not so good. So what is it about the other one? There is no satisfactory way to settle the disagreement. The translation might be that the total available evidence equally justifies my view and your conflicting view. So maybe there's no fact of the matter, right? Um, but there's a problem with this as well. Well, then why not suspend judgment? Why believe anything? Why hold the position if the evidence can equally justify my view and your view? It would seem that the reasonable course would be to suspend judgment. Um, there are two problems with this. One is that it begs the question. So if we are agreeing to disagree, right? Um, what justification do I have for remaining steadfast? If we're agreeing to disagree, and there's no satisfactory way to settle the disagreement, it would seem that I don't have any independent reason to remain steadfast. And that also would then lead to dogmatism. I'm right and you're wrong. So agreeing to disagree on either one of these interpretations leads to or can lead to dogmatism, okay? What is the implication of this kind of agreeing to disagree? on religious exclusivism. Um, well, for the religious exclusivist, right, there's only one true path to God, right? You're wrong, but you're entitled to your opinion. I have access to, and I believe in the true path to God. You're entitled to your opinion. We can agree to disagree, but you're wrong, right? Um, and then the epistemic interpretation of that would be that the total evidence doesn't support your view or you've gone wrong somewhere in your reasoning, right? Um, so the agreeing to disagree position for religious exclusivists, right, um, can also lead to dogmatism, right? It's, it just happens to be, <laughs> it just happens to be a tolerant, I suppose, dogmatism, right? There is questions as to how tolerant it it really is. Um, on the religious pluralist side, there are many equally good paths to God, right? That's a standard pluralist position. But then we run into this problem, then why not just suspend judgment? Why believe in any one path, right? If there are equally good paths to God, it would seem that we should just suspend judgment, just be agnostic about it, right? It seems to be inconsistent to both believe that there are many paths to God and then also be an adherent of a particular faith, right? Um, 
So a pluralist position seems to require, if, he, if religious pluralism is what we're striving for, and I think that that is what we should strive for, um, it requires a good theory of reasonable disagreement. Um, what justification might I have for remaining steadfast and also avoid dogmatism? Okay? And that's really what I'm shooting for. Um, though I should reemphasize that this is within an intra-religious context, right? within Islam, but of course, I think it can be expanded to inter-religious um, discourse as well. Okay. So my view of religious pluralism is that there is one true path to God. We're trying to find it and disagreement is instrumentally helpful in this quest, right? So that is what I take to be a proper view of religious pluralism. So this requires a good theory of disagreement, right? A good theory of reasonable disagreement. So what is the current received wisdom? So um, it's all about the evidence, right? If we're justified in believing anything, um, then our belief should be properly based upon the total available evidence. Well, um, impermissivists about evidence say that when you're given a body of evidence and a proposition, the proposition is justified just in case the evidence supports it and the proposition is I should say properly, properly based on the evidence. Okay. Um, evidence, according to impermissiveness, is the only relevant epistemic factor. And there is a direct one-way relationship between evidence and justification. Given that, if evidence permits only one rational belief, well, how do we explain disagreement between people who are reasoning from the same evidence? So if evidence is the only epistemic consideration and peers are sharing the same evidence, how do we explain disagreement between people who are reasoning from the same evidence? Um, impermissivists will say, should suspend judgment, okay? Um, but I think that we can come up with a more satisfactory answer than that. Um, and the reason why I resist just saying, well, let's suspend judgment is because if we have enough instances of these kinds of disagreements, which I think we do have many of them, um, then we are at risk of falling into a skeptical trap, right? Falling into skepticism. How about permissivists? So permissivists um, say there are other relevant epistemic factors besides evidence. Thus, when we apply these other factors like um, reasoning standards, evidence permits more than one rational belief. So two people with the same evidence can apply different reasoning standards and arrive at um, equally reasonable um, beliefs based on the same evidence. Um, so what's the problem? Well, what determines whether a proposition is justified, if not the evidence? Um, this is a problem that permissivists have to deal with because if there can be more than one justified belief, what justification does anyone have for remaining steadfast? This also seems to be prone to a slippery slope into skepticism. Okay. So a good theory of reasonable disagreement, I think, has to explain how we can justifiably remain steadfast when we become aware their epistemic peer disagrees with us without also believing that the opposing view is unreasonable. Okay? We have to be able to somehow justify that they justifiably believe that there can be more than one reasonable belief while also remaining steadfast.
So I think that mutual reasonable disagreement between peers is possible, but not in the way that epistemologists are typically thinking about it. Um, I think that um, evidence actually has, when, when philosophers talk about evidence, they're actually talking about it in two different senses. I think that sometimes they talk about evidence in the metaphysical sense. So evidence has this necessary relationship to propositions. Um, and other times, epistemologists talk about evidence in an epistemic sense that includes reasoning. So evidence, or I should say, sorry, information or data has an evidential relationship to a proposition just in case someone recognizes that it has that evidential relationship, right? So, I mean, an example that <laughs> my advisor, um, Bruce Russell is fond of giving is that, you know, gun at the bottom of the river, you know, the gun at the bottom of the river that has a fingerprints of the perpetrator um, is evidence in the metaphysical sense, but that gun at the bottom of the river doesn't become evidence in the epistemic sense until someone fishes it out and recognizes that it is the gun that was shot by so-and-so to kill. Right. So I, I make this distinction in my dissertation, um, but I'm not, that's as much as I'm gonna say about it here in the interest of time. So I think mutual reasonable disagreement between peers is possible, but not in the way you might think. So some clarification of terms, who are peers? Well, these two gentlemen are both sheikhs, leading scholars in the field of Islamic law. Um, Khaled Abul Fadl, who is on the left, is um, an Islamic scholar out of University of California. Um, he is a, a sheikh properly because of his background in education. Um, uh, sheikh Ahmad al Tayyid on the right is the Grand Mufti um, scholar sheikh at the Al Azhar in Egypt. Arguably, they're peers because they have access to the same evidence. They draw their conclusions from the same body of evidence. Um, they are equivalently knowledgeable and um, versed in you know, Islamic jurisprudence and the sources that you know, Muslims use to derive Islamic opinions. So who are peers? Peers share the same evidence and they are equivalently knowledgeable and equivalent reasoners with respect to the question, to the proposition. What makes a belief reasonable? Um, and this is where I'm still working on and would love some feedback and probably take some questions. <laughs> what makes a belief reasonable? Well, um, I say that a well-reasoned belief doesn't violate our epistemic duties. So there are no fallacies, there's no logical inconsistencies, there's no, um, you know, it doesn't violate our, our epistemic duties. What are epistemic duties? We follow proper rules of inference, uh, like including all relevant and available evidence and fitting our beliefs to the evidence. Um, we avoid deductive and inductive fallacies. So all of these things I think are attributes. I don't know if they're necessarily sufficient, but you know, at the very least, these are you know, necessary for a belief to be reasonable. Um, so here's my controversial claim. It is possible that your opponent's belief is reasonable, but not justified. So I take apart reasonable and justified um, attributions of beliefs. And you might be wondering why this is controversial. Well, presumably, if a view has been well-reasoned, it ought to be justified. Shouldn't good reasoning 
imply justification? Like if we've reasoned properly and our view is reasonable, shouldn't it be? And, and when I say reasonable, I am sort of narrowly referring to epistemically reasonable. Surely there are pragmatic ways in which we can be reasonable, right? Um, but I'm talking about reasonable really in this narrow epistemic sense of reasonable. Um, so when a view is uh, you know, well-reasoned, then that view is epistemically reasonable. Um, well, if reasonable disagreement between peers is possible, I think reasoning and justification must come apart somewhere. Okay, um, we'll see why. So taking this notion, this idea of reasonable disagreement between peers and applying it to the hijab fatwa, so the legal opinion, the fatwa with respect to hijab, with respect to women's head covering. Um, Sheikh Khalid Abu al-Fadl has, you know, holds this view, Islam does not require women to cover their hair. And then Sheikh Ahmad al-Tayyib holds the view that Islam requires women to cover their hair. Okay. So these are the opposing views. And what I want to say about this is that um, I hold the position that evidence is permissive insofar as there are other justificatory considerations beyond evidence. So evidence is necessary, but is not sufficient for determining what is a true belief or more accurately, what is a justified belief. Um, and these other elements on my theory are reasoning standards and epistemic principles. So I'm gonna take that idea that there are there can be various rational reasoning standards and epistemic principles and apply that to tafsir, to the interpretation of the Quran. So on the one hand, it is pretty common, pretty standard within um, Quranic studies circles that there are these hermeneutical principles, right? One of them is this, that the Quran is unified whole with the unity of purpose. Um, this principle can then justify, you know, certain reasoning standards like these. So on the one hand, and, um, and these are exclusive, by the way, um, we cannot hold these reasoning standards consistently together. Um, it's either one or the other. Um, so either one believes that um, there is this singularity of meaning, that the authorial intent is singular, and is disclosed through the text gradually over time. Um, therefore, um, there is this problem of apparent contradictions in the Quran, and these can be resolved by a chronological reading of the Quran. So later verses would, um, would cancel the earlier ones. And this is what's called the reasoning standard of Nasr. Um, on the other hand, you might think that there, um, your reasoning standard might be that there is a consistent logic through that runs through the Quran, that this consistent logic secures the meaning of the rhetorical disclosure over time. Um, so what appear to be contradictions in the Quran are actually resolved by contextualist reading. Um, and by reading the, the text contextually, you can discover that there are certain circumstantial you know, purposes or rational grounds for the verse, okay? So these are you know, pretty well understood hermeneutical principles. 
um, for understanding the Quran, epistemic principles, I argue, are the grounds upon which we think our reasoning standards on the left um, are sound. So when um, Quranic scholars engage in these sort of inconsistent and different ways of interpreting the Quran, um, what, what is missing in the discourse is this further epistemic principle. So what are the grounds upon which one method of reasoning is better than another? How do we determine whether you know, the singularity of meaning approach is more sound than the consistent logic approach or vice versa? Right? So that's where the epistemic principles come in. And one principle might be this principle of edict, um, that the literal meaning of the Quranic verse is what ought to relevantly guide Muslims in every place and time. And hopefully you can see that this, this principle might very well be a justification for that singularity of meaning standard, right? And it's associated most often with a, with a textualist interpretation of the Quran. On the other hand, there might be this principle of reason, that the reason for or rationale behind the content of the Quranic verse is the relevant reason upon which correct practice and belief are based. And you can hopefully see that this kind of epistemic principle, or this principle of reason, would be a justification for the reasoning standard of consistent logic, okay? and is most often associated with a contextualist interpretation of the Quran. Okay, um, so to sum up this slide, there's a you know it's pretty dense. Um, basically, I'm saying that these principles and standards exist um, in plurality within. Um, religious studies and are you know, the standards upon which reasoning from the text to Islamic legal opinions are based. But there is no further, nowhere else that you can really go. There is no further justification, for instance, for whether the principle of edict is more correct or the principle of reason is more correct. Um, so given that there is this plurality of standards and, and principles with no independent and universally accepted way of determining which of these is more correct, um, unless they violate certain you know, rules of reasoning, um, rational rules, they, it seems as though they're okay. It's okay to use them. Um, and this is where you know, these verses, oh, I noticed the typo, sorry. It is supposed to be 31, so this is correct. It is verse 31, um, where these verses that speak directly about, you know, what is appropriate, you know, how one should, how a woman in particular should um, execute her ethic of modesty, right? Or, um, you know, observe the ethic of modesty. Um, is open to interpretation. If you apply a contextualist, you'll get one answer. If you go literally, you'll get another answer. Um, so the key here, right, is here, that they should not display their beauty and ornaments, except what ordinarily appear thereof, or what is ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that they should draw their veils over their bosoms and not display their beauty except 
and then list all these family members. And then in the other verse, um, tell thy wives and daughters and believing women that they should cast their outer garments over their persons. Okay, so what does that mean? Right? Um, so the expression and the representation of modesty, right? Um, we can agree is definitely open to interpretation. So who is justified and who is not? Um, well, I've only shown you two verses of the two chapters or verses from the Quran. Um, I should add the caveat that there is a lot more information out there in terms of the traditions of the prophet and the companions of the prophet, history um, out there that, you know, you know, scholars use to justify one position or the other. Um, this circle I put out here represents all shared available and relevant information. Um, but I think that if disagreement exists, even just between these two verses of the Quran, the more evidence you pile on, the more ever information you bring in, it just makes the disagreement even harder to resolve. Um, so when Sheikh Khaled Abul Fadl approaches this body of evidence, including the two verses that I showed you, um, he's gonna apply a principle of reason, right? He's gonna take a contextualist approach. He believes that this principle of reason is the correct one. Um, and he concludes from his reasoning, from the evidence that Islam does not require, require women to cover their hair. And then on the other hand, Sheikh Ahmad al Tayyib applies a principle of edict. And I should say that um, in my dissertation, I, I analyze their, their arguments. Um, I haven't you know, brought out their arguments here. You'll just have to <laughs> take my word for it, um, but they do. So Sheikh Khaled Abul Fadl applies this principle of reason in his work. Uh, Sheikh Ahmad al Tayyib applies this principle of edict in his work. Um, and these principles, um, it's not as though they come out and say, well, I'm applying a principle of reason, but that is the approach that they're taking. Um, nor does, you know, Sheikh al Tayyib come out and say, well, I'm applying this principle of edict. Um, these are principles that I've derived with the help of my committee um, from from their work, okay? So from, by applying this principle of edict that, you know, taking a more um, textualist and literalist approach to the sources, he concludes that Islam indeed requires women to cover their hair, okay? Um, my conclusion from this is that if there is no way of settling whether the principle of reason is more sound, or whether the principle of edict is more sound. These two sheikhs are in a reasonable disagreement. Okay? Um, the question is, when Sheikh Khaled Abul Fadl becomes aware of Sheikh Atayeb's disagreement, what effect should that disagreement have on his existing view and vice versa, right? Um, my conclusion is that if we separate what is reasonable from what is justified, it is possible for Sheikh Abul Fadl to retain his view that his view is justified and consistently believe that Sheikh Ahmad Tayyib's view is also reasonable, though not justified. Okay, um, and this is, um, I th I think, significantly different from 
merely agreeing to disagree, okay? Um, because it provides the opportunity for peers to engage with and understand and indeed seek to understand the reason for their disagreement. And upon understanding what the reason for their disagreement is and understanding that, well, maybe there's no way to really settle which principle is the more correct one, um, they can remain justified while also believing that the opposing view is also reasonable and vice versa. Okay. So that's when, that's what's called interpersonal, right? Disagreement. But what about for people looking in from the outside, right? What is the implication for collective belief, right? What is the implication on saying, making claims about what Islam really believes? Um, well, if it is possible for epistemic peers and leading scholars like these two, Abu Fadl and Atayeb, who purportedly speak on behalf of the group at large to reasonably disagree on a central belief, then the truth of the claim that Islam believes this thing remains undefined. So looking in from the outside, I'm saying this is what the implication for collective belief is. And then, so then what is the implication for the hijab fatwa? What is the implication for these conflicting views about whether Islam does or does not require hijab or require head covering? Well, unless someone can locate independent epistemic grounds for weighing one principle more heavily than another, and that does not merely rest on pragmatic grounds, there are you know, pragmatic reasons out there for you know, wearing a headscarf or not wearing a headscarf, um, but those aren't relevant to the truth of the matter. The truth about whether Islam requires women to cover their hair, I argue, remains undefined. And if the truth about whether Islam requires women to cover their hair remains undefined, then whether a woman decides to cover her hair or not, does not and should not define her membership status within the group. Okay. And that is the end of my talk. I don't even know how long I went. I hope I'm within time. Yes, you're in good time. <laughs> now um, is the Q&A portion of um, this brown bag. So we ask that if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or you can post any of your questions in the chat as well. And don't forget to unmute your mic. Amari, it couldn't have been that lucid. There's got to be. <laughs> I, th I thought I saw John, John um, raise his hand. I... No, he, he, he didn't. <laughs> um, Layla, I have, I have a question. This is Mark. Hi, Mark. Thanks for uh, coming. My pleasure. Thank you for the talk. So um, I, something that caught my attention at the, uh, towards the end of your talk was you used the phrase um, that the answer as to whether or not Islam requires uh, wearing hijab was undefined. So that there's a way in which like, um, there is no answer to that question. So this strikes me as a way in which how your um, your epistemology of disagreement applies to religion might be different than how it applies to certain other domains. So if we make the distinction between what's reasonable and what's justified, um, uh, in, in some domains, it may be the case that um, two parties, and I'm, I'm thinking of some of the examples from your um, dissertation, like the horse race case, in some domains, it might be that both parties are reasonable, 
but only one could possibly be justified because there's some sort of like external truth maker. Mm -hmm. With um, religion, um, well, you might think there is some sort of like external truth maker. You might think that there is some sort of like right answer, but you also might think certain truths in religious domains are constitutive of what the members think. Um, so part of why it might be the case that there's, that the answer is undefined is because of the nature of religious truths and sort of, um, uh, to, if you think the community can create certain religious truths, Roman Catholicism might be one where this is like a bit easier. Like, do you think like there's a way in which like truths are created by the tradition, or maybe that's not right. Maybe you think they just the tradition figures out the truth, but I'm wondering, so sorry, this is getting rambly. The, the, like the short version is I'm wondering to what extent sort of like the, the part of your answer whereby you say that the truth is underdetermined. It's sort of like specific to the domain of religion um, or what other aspects of your picture might be religion, religious epistemology specific versus just epistemology specific. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And, and thank you for that question. It, it's something that I'm still struggling with. Um, so the case that you're referring to is, is one where two people are watching a horse race and um, it's a photo finish and, um, you know, there is a truth of the matter that it's not a tie, somebody has won, but it's too close to call just by the naked eye. And so um, the, the parties involved are able to you know, reasonably disagree about who won the race um, before the, um, the race is called. Um, there is, you know, hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop there because there's, <laughs> there's more to go into with that. But I think what you're asking is, um, does the way in which um, religious disagreements, um, remain undefined, is that different from other domains where there can be a truth of the matter, um, but is not discovered yet. Am I understanding? That yes, you? yeah. So I guess yeah. I think it part comes down to partly sort of like your um, your view of what the truth makers are in the domain of religion. Um, yeah, I on it, to tell you the truth, Mark, I'm not terribly interested in truth per se, um, and I know that. Um, because I think that the linking of justification to truth is hugely problematic. Um, ah, okay. Um, but in terms of um, the aspiration of getting at the truth, um, that, you know, why we engage in justification, why we engage or are interested in good reasoning is to get as close to the truth as possible. Um, I think that's where that's where I'm at. And I, I said this in my talk, where um, I think that religious pluralism is a, a place where, and, and sort of a mental place where, you know, there is one truth, this one true path. Um, but we're all just trying to get there. We're all just, you know, um, the, the paradox, I think, where religion is concerned, and I haven't thought about how it really applies to outside of religious domains, but where religion is concerned is that if you've arrived, you're probably dead. Um, like it's really, um, <laughs> That, that there is, that I think that there is a truth about, you know, 
who made this world, if anybody made this world and, you know, what our purpose in this life is. And I think there's, you know, this truth is out there. Um, but um, I think the best way that we can even hope to understand even a little bit is, is through engaging in disagreement and engaging in, in religious pluralist discourse. Um, Thanks, so um, when I say that I don't, so when I say undefined, I don't mean that there's, you know, that the truth makers um, are the people and their disagreement means that um, haven't arrived at the truth. I think that there is a truth independent of the reasoners and the reasoners are trying to achieve that or understand that. Thanks, that's really helpful. That's exactly what I was um, wondering about. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the question. Sure. Hey, Bruce. So I, I just wanna make a small point about undefined. I have another question, but I'll back out and let people ask questions. I, I uh, kind of twitched every time you said undefined. I would have used the word undetermined. Okay. <laughs> The evidence doesn't determine the truth, but it doesn't mean it's undefined. The truth is there. It's about the true path that you're saying. Uh, uh, let's let's just assume that's right. There is a true path. There's a truth about whether God exists and all that stuff. It's, it's just that I think you believe that the evidence by itself doesn't determine what we should believe. That's your basic view. Yeah. And so that's why the sheikhs can disagree because... Mm -hmm. The evidence they share, we're assuming, but then there are other principles of reasoning that leads them to different conclusions. So that's only my suggestion on this point is maybe you should use undetermined or indeterminate instead of undefined. Yeah, I think you're right, Bruce. I think you're right. I, I have no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I have bigger questions, but I'll, I'll just back off and let people ask. I have a Another question about the principles of reasoning and so forth. But okay. I'll mute. So I have a question about the instrumental value of disagreement. I think Leila, at the beginning, you said that um, disagreement has this instrumental value in getting us closer to the truth or closer to God. So I guess um, I'm thinking about, so there, there can be, the process of disagreement from which truth emerges. And that's what we are aiming for, right? This, um, a reasoning process. But then when we have reached reasonable disagreement where all the epistemic peers have discharged their epistemic duties and there's no independent way to kind of weigh the principles that are governing the beliefs and there's no further evidence to be gained, then at that point of reasonable disagreement, um, does that disagreement itself have any value? So is it merely that disagreement as a process from which you know, we're supposed to kind of get all these truths from which truth emerges, that process is valuable instrumentally, but what does the reasonable disagreement itself when we have reached it among epistemic peers and there's no you know, further epistemic step to be taken, what, what value does that have in relationship to truth? That's it, I, merely that, that, is, that truth is just undetermined at that point. And so we have an epistemic duty to just leave it undetermined. Yeah. I, thank you so much for that. Uh, I can't call you Catherine. I have to call you Dr. Kim. <laughs> I call Bruce Bruce all day. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I'm really glad you asked this question because um, I, I, I clearly didn't explain that properly. So I didn't mean to imply that once you've achieved reasonable disagreement, then you've arrived, that okay, there's nowhere else to go from there. Um, how I envision reasonable disagreement is an epistemic status 
that you've achieved, but that doesn't imply that there isn't further evidence that you can gain or that there isn't further work to be done. Um, in, in fact, it, it might imply the opposite, um, that if so far with the evidence that you have, that the truth remains undetermined, um, then you have more work to do. That maybe with the evidence that you've you know, collected so far, you're justified in believing P, right? Um, but that this reasonable disagreement exists, that you're in this reasonable disagreement with somebody who believes not P based on the same evidence with different reasoning standards and principles would imply that there's further work to be done, right? That there's more investigation to engage in. Does that, does that, does that help? Does that make sense? Or am I? <laughs> I think, no, no, no. Um, so I think maybe that I didn't really understand that uh, reasonable disagreement between the two scholars, because I thought you were presenting it as a disagreement where it's an example where, um, although work that can be humanly done. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. I didn't okay. mean it that way. Okay, that no, I the, didn't quite understand that. Thing. Yeah, that is the total available and relevant evidence, mm -hmm. but there, there can, and maybe the circle was a misrepresentation, was not a good representation as though there's nothing beyond that. But um, that's the, what I meant to represent is the total available and relevant evidence, but then there might be other stuff out there, um, that it's not a complete set. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Can I jump in? Yes, yes, sure. Oh, okay. Thank you for the talk, Layla. Thanks for coming, Larry. Uh, yeah, doctor, Dr. Larry. Doctor, sorry, okay. Dr. Lombard. It's Dr. Lombard, right. thank you for coming. I, I, I accept my status, it's perfectly okay. <laughs> I want to talk, uh, press you a little bit about the idea of agreeing to disagree. Go ahead. I understand a case of that. Uh, we just might call it low hanging fruit. I think my dog, pictured behind me, is the most beautiful dog on the planet. You happen to think your dog is. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I don't want to convince you that I'm right, even though I clearly am. You don't want to convince me that you're right, even though you think you clearly are. It just doesn't matter. Let's just agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. In other case, it matters a great deal. And so it seems to me that we cannot agree to disagree. Two, two cases. Suppose one of my beliefs is actually blasphemous and is literally damnable. Insofar as you are concerned with my welfare, you cannot be satisfied with my having this damnable false belief. As far as you're concerned, unless you I hate cannot, you, you cannot, <laughs> like, go ahead. right? Insofar as you you care, right? You cannot just say, "Oh well, we'll agree to disagree," and you are damned, right? Mm -hmm. That's not an appropriate attitude. In other cases, it's even worse because there are some religious traditions where my, say, heretical beliefs threaten you. Not because I'm going to do something with my heretical belief, but rather that somebody's religious belief is such that I cannot be saved unless everybody has the right beliefs. This is not bizarre. This is actually fairly mainline. We cannot agree to disagree here because my welfare hangs on your not believing the, the silly stuff that you believe or, or, or vice versa. Uh, so I don't understand the role of agree to disagree except in cases where it just doesn't matter what we believe at all. Uh, we can't agree to disagree about anything where the topic is anything serious. But, but Larry, you're, you're ignoring a whole slew of cases where it, it is appropriate 
to agree to disagree. The, the example that I gave in my talk is appropriate to agree to disagree. Yeah, uh, it's just that I, I don't know whether to, to characterize those cases as, as, as easy cases where it doesn't matter or hard cases where it does. I mean, are there going to be intermediate cases? And I, I guess I'm looking for a general characterization of when it doesn't matter that my beliefs are false, right? It doesn't matter. When does it not matter so that you can say, okay, you can have those beliefs. We'll just agree to disagree. But Larry, I don't think that this is low hanging fruit. I mean, consider, you know, the hijab laws in Iran, consider the hijab laws in Saudi Arabia. I think, you know, consider, you know, I, I really don't think that it is low hanging fruit. I think that there are, are a lot of um, Muslims in the world who take great interest in whether this proposition is true or not. Um, and, and, and will go so far as to, you know, create laws about it. I understand. Yeah. But those seem to be cases where one cannot reasonably say, I, it doesn't matter to me what you believe. Well, or will it just agree to disagree? Right, right. I mean, good point. So if we, you know, hop across the pond and, you know, across the Mediterranean Sea to Iran, right, then there surely people are going to, you know, people who are in politics and who are, you know, governing Iran make the case that it is my duty to enforce this because there are further, um, you know, um, verses in the Quran that say that we should enjoin the good and forbid the evil and what better way to do it than to legislate it. Right. Uh, and and um, they will not and do not agree to disagree. Um, my view is in absolute contradiction to that position and say no, with respect to women's head covering, there is you know, differing opinions about this and those um, beliefs are based on these principles for which there is no clear way to determine what principle is more justified or more sound. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there are people who will not want to agree to disagree on this issue, um, but I'm saying that, well, you really should. Um, but in this, you know, in, in terms of reasonable um, disagreement. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll I may not be able to travel to Iran this summer. We'll <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, I see Bruce raised his hands just now. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't know, to Larry, as you say, I thought uh, Layla set aside pragmatic considerations, and these are broadly construed pragmatic considerations, really important ones about how you fare in a society or whether you're going to be saved or damned and alike. But I thought she was just talking about disagreements strictly when they had to do about truth, about some matter, pragmatic considerations aside. But I was going to ask you, Layla, I actually think there is another level to uh, address this question about uh, following the principle of edict or the principle of reason. Uh, I'm not sure those are really epistemic principles. In any case, I think they're not basic ones. But here, more specifically, is what I have in mind. I think if you look at the Quran, you tell me, but it, that you could probably figure out and people could agree about what are the central, uh, what is the central position about ethics? And you at one point in your talk said, it's an ethics of modesty. And I think there's a way to, to gain ground if you assume that. And it's so if you find in the Quran or over time, different views about uh, whether this behavior, wearing a headscarf or whatever is modest or not, I think you can say, ah, I see it traces back to the fundamental notion of modesty, if we could get an analysis, analytic philosophy, of modesty, then we could say, oh, in different, 
historical periods or different contexts, no wonder that they'll say one thing at one time or place and another thing at another time or place. That's just the way that fundamental moral principles work. They're context sensitive. And so now it looks like we all should agree that the fundamental ethic in the Quran is one of modesty. What does modesty require? And that will kind of say, I don't, that it's more in keeping with the principle of reason, I think, but you can see how I'm trying to appeal to something which is more basic than either of those principles that you cite on sort of that right column. Okay, so what is the, the more fundamental, the, the ethic? Appeal to the appeal to the fundamental ethic in the Quran to explain apparent inconsistencies or in general to justify a contemporary position on some view about say wearing the headscarf or not. You nowadays it is not, I mean just sketching an argument, modesty is the central principle of ethics. And nowadays in this context, it's not immodest to fail to wear the headscarf. Don't appeal to those particular things that the Quran says. That is kind of against the principle of edict, which are literalist. It says, go back to the fundamental ethical principle and now apply it in a contemporary context and ask yourself, if you do that, how is behavior immodest, not wearing the headscarf in this particular contemporary context. That's the way I think reasoning should go about what the Quran means. Oh, sorry, Dr. Edwards, did you want to come in? No, 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 no. I was, um, in fact, I was waving to, to, to Kennedy. She has to leave. And I told her that I'll, I'll take over the whole thing from now on. Oh, OK. Yeah, there are okay. more questions. So you don't, <laughs> you don't ever want to. Um, Stop philosophers from from having their say. Thank you, Kennedy. God forbid. God, God forbid. Yeah. You better be ready to stick around a long time, Walter. <laughs> um, thank you, Kennedy. I really appreciate everything you did and and, and your help. Um, um. Thank you so much. I have a meeting at, uh, a little in a couple minutes, but I do appreciate you. It's been a pleasure working with you and your presentation. Very well crafted. So thankful to have you. Sorry I have to dip out, but you're in good hands with Dr. Edwards, <laughs> as you already know. <laughs> Bye. Um, so I guess what I would ask you, Bruce, then is what makes your principle more sound or more fundamental? Like, I, I'm, for some reason, I'm just not seeing the difference between what you're saying and, and the um, principle of reason. It, it, if anything, justifies relying on the principle of reason rather than edict. I was saying, you said there's no higher standard to appeal to at one point or maybe in mm -hmm. Q&A. And my answer, my uh, comment is no there is so why uh, why does it make that why how does that justify because, the principle of reason because it says don't look at what the text literally says look at the fundamental ethical principle in the quran and apply it to the contemporary circumstances okay but i'm asking why is that more justified or more correct that, what, make, that, what makes, how does that make the principle of reason more correct? That's what, that's what I'm not be, seeing. Because if you just uh, uh, attend to what the principle of edict says, you, you just look at what the words say in the text. But maybe the words that were in the text actually say uh, you have to interpret them in a contemporary context in a way that doesn't violate the fundamental moral principle of modesty. Because okay, if what, you if the, what if the contemporary context is immoral? What if the contemporary context oh. it doesn't is unjust and immoral? So somebody who espouses the principle of edict 
will say that the that original community that um, was informed by the Quran is actually the moral community, and that's the community that should be emulated, and that is the definition of, you know, the the best, you, ethic, the best. Moral that's community. going backward. That that's denying that the principle of modesty is the fundamental ethical principle. It's saying the fundamental ethical principle are all these detailed comments about whether you should wear a headscarf or not that are, appear if they do in the Quran. It's upside yes. down principle of edict. <laughs> oh, but that it's not, like you're you're bringing in your own background principles, Bruce. But what's I thought that, your background principles are more correct? I thought they all agreed that the principle. The, the uh, ethic of modesty was the fundamental moral principle in the Quran. Ah, so that, right. So, but no? the represent, yes, yes, you're absolutely right. So according to the principle, so maybe this is the problem. Like I, I only provided the verses in the Quran, um, but the principle of edict would also apply to the traditions of the prophet and um, the, um, you know, the traditions of the early community and how they lived. Um, so according to the principle of edict, that early community represents the ideal community, the ideal um, representation of, in this case, the ethic of modesty. Yeah, I was thinking that, you know, modesty means something and not, not, not other things. So let's understand what modesty means. That's what we should be doing. And then we could apply that principle, and we could probably have a, a, a better, it would explain all the data better than once we, you know, sort of analyze what modesty is, it would explain all the data in the Quran, mm -hmm. better particular edicts about what it said. Oh, why did it say that? Oh, because modesty is the basic principle, and in this context, it said, do so-and-so. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and, if you figure out what modesty is, then you can see how it can have, uh, you know, different uh, implications in different contexts. So there is a prior modesty question is. to that in this context, mm -hmm. Bruce. There is a prior question, which is, um, what evidence is is um, what is the best evidence for determining what modesty is um, and in for those Go. who follow the principle of reason the best evidence for determining what modesty is would be to look at society look at society look at you know what you know how to best um, be modest for lack of a better whereas in the, in the principle of the edict would say the best evidence is the early community. Look at them. How did they live? That is the, you know, the I, best evidence of determining what. I'm uh, offering a third alternative. Okay. You don't look at what society says. Who cares what society says? <laughs> They'll probably get it wrong. Who cares what it said back when? They'll get it wrong. Think about what modesty is. That's what reason requires. Think about what modesty is and then see how it will apply and have different implications in different contexts. That's the principle of reason, really. It's not about mm -hmm. just what society says. And the advantage of that view is, I claim, you have to tell me, Layla, if it actually pans out, that it will actually make more sense of the particular things the Quran says that on their face seem contradictory. Mm -hmm. I'm no utilitarian. They always say, well, it, we our basic principle is do the action which produces most good on balance. Sometimes it's lying, sometimes it's telling the truth, and so forth. So we can explain all. Oh, it seems like it's contradictory. You said lie there. Now you say tell the truth. What's wrong with you? You have a contradictory uh, moral theory, Bruce. No, I have a basic moral theory, and it recognizes the importance of different contexts. That's what the principle of people following the principle should, of reason should do. Don't look at society, what they say. Don't look at what the text says. Look at what the fundamental principle says, and then you can explain everything. Just like utilitarians 
hope they can. You have to go back to some fundamental principle and then apply it. Oh, well, that's my speech. <laughs> I, I'm having difficulty understanding how we might do that without You're referring an to- You um, have to go, you, as Plato said, you better go to the philosophers, <laughs> but know what modesty is. <laughs> We don't want to hear it. We are principle of reason. We want to know what modesty is. That's the fundamental question. And then we can apply it all over, just like utilitarians do. Well, Leila, I, 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 I'm about I'm to not say, done. I, I'm about to say that maybe you guys can agree to disagree, but that's. <laughs> no. We already have. <laughs> <laughs> Walter, don't encourage that. This has been going on for I don't know years. Uh, no, no, no. They have disagreed to agree. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I want to thank I want to thank Leila and um, and the philosophers who participated in the discussion for this talk. Of course, we can go on and on and on and on. But I, uh, I see that uh, from a, we've only got uh, 10 people left and people are leaving. So perhaps uh, you can all um, talk to Leila, Leila uh, separately. And we do have the, um, the, the tip, the, the, the recording of the, of the talk. And I think Leila has given, up, given us permission to, to post it on our website so you can actually Listen to it again, and I disagree with her on other points uh, in addition. But I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, in the chat, um, Kennedy put our call for speakers. We have begun to recruit for next year so that um, the philosophers in the audience uh, who have enjoyed this talk and this format, uh, please consider uh, signing up uh, the fall series is going to be mainly or, or entirely or virtual unless somebody in the fall insists on giving it in person and we'll try to accommodate. But uh, in the winter 2022, we hope to have uh, in-person uh, talks. Uh, we do have uh, two small gifts to give to Leila. One, a mask with the, with the center's logo and a journal with the with the center's logo, but we will give them to you uh, as you know when, when it's safe to do you. that when we're back on campus. But um, can, I, can I pass on the mask? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want another mask. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I'm kidding. <laughs> you don't. You don't want the mask? No, no, no. I'm, I'm kidding. I would never turn down a gift. No, I'm kidding. It's just you know the world we're in is like oh. A mask. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for thank coming. Thank you. And um, thank you, Leila. And uh, and I hope the rest of the semester goes well for all of us. Thank you. You too. And thanks for 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 coming. Okay. Bye bye. See you, Leila. Bye. <laughs>